this, says David Montgomery, is the most precious resource of all, and we've been mining it for millennia. Soil is a resource that's renewable only at a glacial pace, and when it disappears from what was once known as the Fertile Crescent, what's left are the deserts of modern Iraq. David Montgomery is the author of Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations. He's also the author of King of Fish, The Thousand-Year Run of Salmon, a study of the forces that have all but eliminated this magnificent fish from its original habitat in Europe, Britain, and eastern North America, and threatened to eliminate it in the Pacific Northwest as well. Dr. Montgomery is a geomorphologist, a scientist who studies the forces that shape the landscape. His two books, he says, are parallel stories of decline, linked by the fact that one of the main forces shaping the landscape is you and me. We spoke in his office at the University of Washington in Seattle. If, if you think about soil the way a geologist does, you start to come to think about it almost as a strategic resource. And we're, we're fundamentally mining soil to support our agricultural enterprise at present. And yet soil is the basic resource that supports sort of life, all terrestrial ecosystems. It's the way that organic matter gets mixed with mineral matter to create a fertile substrate that feeds more life. And yet we tend to look at it as dirt, thus the title of the book. But it's, um, yet it's really one of the most incredible f substances, fertile soil. Um, it's really what we derive our living from. And yet if you look at it at a planetary scale, we've been essentially mining soil to feed our agricultural enterprise for you know, close to 10,000 years now. And it doesn't form all that fast. So if you look at it in terms of a geological pace, it's a change that's sweeping the planet, but at a very slow rate and very much under our control. And when we've been mining it, um, it doesn't recover on the kind of timescales that we're that are of any, any concern to us. No, if, if you look at the uh, the pace at which soil is forms in natural systems, the USDA puts out an estimate that an inch of topsoil would form in about 500 years. And in different environments, you can have different rates, but the key, the key common element is you're talking centuries to thousands of years to form an inch of fertile soil. And yet, if you look at the pace at which soil can be lost off of conventionally worked and plowed agricultural fields, you can be losing an inch in 25, 30 years at a, at, at a rate that's a millimeter a year, slow enough that in any one year, it doesn't seem like a big number. But if it runs year after year, that far ahead of the pace at which soil is rebuilt and replaced, you're essentially drawing down the store of, of what, what, for all intents and purposes, really is uh, the world's natural capital. And you'd never notice. And you'd never notice. It happens so slow. Uh, our lives are so short relative to the pace at which Earth replenishes soil that over the course of a lifetime uh, as a farmer, you could look back and notice the change of a loss of an inch or two of soil. But in any given but measured year, measured against what? You don't. Yeah. yeah, but measured against what? Yeah, how would you um, see that? Yeah. And you can, I mean, you you can you if you're trained as a geologist, you can read it in the landscape in places. But uh, if you're not, it can literally take a whole lifetime to get the perspective to look back and actually see the magnitude of the change. But even so, it's the changes over multiple generations that really add up to influence human societies. And those changes are really hard, it seems, for societies to act on. Um, Slow motion crises never really become the crisis du jour. They just keep grinding along and playing out. And in, in the book you talk about, um, about the, uh, the impact on Rome as the Roman Empire developed and initially was able to feed itself from fairly close at hand and ultimately was kind of ransacking the known world to find, you know, to find soils that would still grow food. Yeah, the story of Rome is, is one of, uh, you know, of many similar civilizations in the sense that the pattern of Farming starting out in lowland areas, spreading up onto hillsides, starting to burn through a local supply of soil, uh, created then a dilemma for society. Do you then go somewhere else and try and uh, find new fertile soils? Perhaps your neighbor's soils, as Rome so successfully did for so long, um, in terms of building an empire. Um, or there's many regions of the world that didn't do that, and they were left with sort of a long-term uh, legacy of degraded soils. And of course, that's the, the case for Rome in the end as well, but they had a long run at, at expansion before they did. Because there's essentially really one basic resource that a society, a large, complex agricultural civilization can't do without, and that's enough fertile soil to generate the food to feed the populace. Um, and so when those two things, the number of people looking to be fed 
and the amount of land that we have that can has the capacity to feed them come into conflict, um, it's it's a recipe for uh, not a terribly good future for society. Yeah, and because our lifetimes are so short, it seems it seems as though we we're born, we look around, and we take whatever we see to be the baseline, and then you know you get to be an old codger like me, and I read a book like yours, and I suddenly realized that North Africa was not always desert, that the Fertile Crescent was actually fertile for a long time, uh, and, and this is not necessarily the baseline, and human beings had something to do with all that. Yeah, I mean, we're really good at that uh, phenomenon of what's called the shifting baseline, where we, um, it, what used to be degraded becomes the new normal, as people who don't know how good it used to be pass through the system, so to speak. Um, but if you think like a geologist, and one of the, you know, with, a, a, the, with the background and training as a geologist, to sort of look at landscapes as transient, as things that change, that are not sort of cast in stone and fixed, the way that most normal people, most non-geologists, sort of look at the land. Because in our lifetimes, it doesn't change all that much. But you look at it over generations, and it can change a lot. And so the example of the, uh, the Middle East as a place that was an agricultural paradise that probably really literally was like the Garden of Eden if you look back far enough. Um, and then you look at it today and those descriptions just don't match. Mm -hmm. There's some it's a, and dis, dissonance there. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's a good example of how things can quite literally change out from under a society if we don't pay attention to that most fundamental asset that humanity has, which is a fertile planet, fertile land, uh, productive land. Yeah, yeah. So I'm gonna, you're a geomorphologist. Um, I think I know what that is, but, tell, but remind me. <laughs> well, a geomorphologist <laughs> is that kind of geologist that studies the evolution of topography. So you know, 100 years ago, I might have been called a physiographer or a physical geographer. I could still be called that today, because um, many physical geographers are geomorphologists. Uh, so it's someone who studies the uh, processes that shape the surface of the Earth, uh, how soils erode, how mountains are built, how rivers move around and create habitat for things like salmon. Um, so I study the, the dynamics that shape Earth's surface. That's really what a geomorphologist is and does. Now, what's the, the reason I ask that partly is because when you say that, you, you, you evoke what I think of a geomorphologist as being, who's the guy who watches the mountains come up at the sides of the tectonic plates and you know, vast and slow processes like that. But you're doing something that's almost more like um, historical geomorphology, that, that much shorter periods of time, and, and with one of the major factors in, uh, well, you could almost call it ecological geomorphology, because human beings are such a large factor in that. Right? We, we move more dirt and rock and change more landscapes and influence other species, you know, per perhaps more than any other species, well, perhaps not more than any other species in the history of the planet, but more than any other species in a long time. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so if you're interested in the processes that change landscapes, as I am, and you look around the world today, um, it's hard to avoid thinking about how we're remodeling the planet. And we're doing it without a blueprint. In fact, we kind of like shoved the blueprint in a drawer before we started. Um, and yet, if there's one thing that's gonna, that we can be sure of that's going to affect future generations, it's, it's the character and nature of the surface of the Earth for the simple reason that that's where we live. Um, and so what we do to it is what our descendants will inherit. And so for someone like me who's interested in landscape change and interested in the future, and um, the idea of actually studying the way that people influence the surface of the Earth and how that in turn influences human societies and ecological systems, it's just inherently an attractive subject. Although your findings are rather scary, right? Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, you know, the, if, if you look backwards at the, the history of human societies in managing land over sort of you know, multi-century, multi-millennia time scales, there's not a lot of really uh, great examples in terms of long-term sustainable land use to point to. There's a couple that, that you know, I, I searched pretty hard to try and include in the book. But the, the dominant story is one of essentially slowly degrading and wearing out soils and then uh, a region paying a long-term price because it takes thousands of years to rebuild them if they're even allowed to rebuild. Um, and so, yeah, the, at present, we're essentially running an experiment that's been run many times in the past. Um, but the difference this time is there's no new continents to go to. Or, or at least no places where we think there aren't people. <laughs> um, 
there's no new planets to go to. Mars is not a terribly val valid option for a farming colony given the nature of its atmosphere and soils. Um, and we have a globally integrated economy and increasingly a globally integrated culture. Um, we have to get it right this time. We don't, the, the, we don't really have the choice of failing in terms of trying to maintain the productive capacity of our agricultural lands. We really do need to get it right this time because we're so interconnected and it's happen we're doing it everywhere all at once. Um, and it's my belief that looking back at the history of um, past societies can actually help us understand the kind of things we need to think about and do and change to ensure a stable long-term future for our own civilization. You had said that modern society risks re, uh, replaying mistakes that hasten the demise of past civilizations. That struck me as being a very measured scientist's expression. <laughs> uh, but basically, that's your warning, isn't it? The warning that comes out of your work? Uh, yes. No, that's, exact, that's, that's it in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the real, um, a very real facet of the problem of soil erosion is that it doesn't happen incredibly fast. In fact, it happens fairly slowly, even by, by most people's standards. Fast by a geologist's standards is still like a snail's pace by most people's standards. A million years to a geologist. <laughs> Nothing, right? Nothing. Yeah. Uh, I wrote exactly. a book called The Living Beach. I hung out with geologists, and uh, I was always struck by that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. like a thousand years is, is nowhere even near a million. Uh, it's a thousand times less. And so when you start looking at, um, problems that play out over decades to, to a geologist, it's, it's really instantaneous. In the policy world, that can be forever, sort of very diametrically opposing views of things. Um, but I've been struck by the, the conundrum of how, with the problem of soil erosion, the very fact that it occurs slowly has made it very difficult to address because it never rises to the crisis de jour status. It's, you know, it's sort of a slow burning crisis. Uh, it, it is difficult to motivate sustained long-term action around um, and so it's my belief that what we need to do is actually come to look at soils differently, think about them differently, um, integrate essentially a soil or land ethic into the way that we use particularly our agricultural lands where it's critically important over the long run. Um, and I think that looking back at ancient, at ancient history, if you will, is a way to try and get a message across to people about the importance of it to our own society without sending people off to their own political corners as soon as you start the debate or argument. Because if you, if you start arguing about uh, GMO foods or if you start arguing about you know, fundamentally reshaping global agriculture and land reform, things that probably need to be done in the long run, if you start there, um, you've already sort of edited the potential field of people that might be willing to listen. But I think the message from the history of past societies is so powerful and so compelling and so undeniable when you put it all together. That the way that I did the research for the book, um, I just vacuumed up everything I could find for as many societies as I could find and then figure out what the common elements were and how to organize it. And the message that emerged was pretty consistent and powerful. And it's politically neutral in the sense that this stuff happened. <laughs> and it happened, I think, for about the reasons that I laid out in the analysis interpretation of it. The question is, will we actually learn the lesson this time? And what, if anything, should we do about it? Um, and there, there's been warnings about the, um, uh, sort of a global soil crisis every few decades for actually about a century and a half. Okay. And we, yeah, George Perkins Marsh wrote the first book. I got a copy of his book in the, the next room. Uh, he, he wrote the uh, book in 1864, I think it was basically a warning about the problem of soil degradation and its effect on ancient societies. And there's books in the 20s and the 40s and the 50s and the 70s. And dirt was my attempt to essentially update the argument, put sort of a bigger um, theoretical framework on it, um, sort of the framework a geologist would put on it, um, but, and try and retell the story. Because it's, it's one of those critical, underappreciated stories that it's just it's underreported, it's underappreciated. Did you find any, any societies that did manage this well over a, an extended period of time? So the shortness of human life and the length of the process yeah. is a big piece of the problem. It is, but there are a couple examples of societies we can point to that have improved soils. And there's actually uh, every reason to believe that we could turn the problem around this time and we could restore soils globally if we put our minds to it and put our, put our collective effort into it. 
Um, but looking back through history, there's an island called Tacopia in the South Pacific that was a good example of a uh, society that developed a very long-term sustainable agriculture. It was a Polynesian culture, same kind of culture that generated the disaster at Easter Island, but they had a different um, model mm -hmm. at, um, at Tacopia where they turned their island into a, um, essentially a multi-story polyculture. They turned their whole island world into a big farm where they, they farmed stuff on the forest floor, they grew breadfruit as a canopy, they reinvest, they took organic matter back to the land, back into the soil, and they took good care of their land, and it sustained their, their society for thousands of years. Now, the trick that they had, which uh, you know, is, is not the most enviable <laughs> trick, is that every few generations they sent a few boatloads of their um, kids off to go find their own island. Um, <laughs> so, you know, they solved the resource population problem in a very different way than, you know, I'd like to see a, the global society solve the problem now. We're not going to be sending people off to Mars to go try and farm. Um, but they, they did take care of their land. Sense. Yeah, some people, you know, actually there are, I could nominate some candidates for potential <laughs> folks I wouldn't mind seeing volunteer to go. But it's just not a, a, a viable population yeah. management uh, thing. But it does underline the point, doesn't it, that, that, that there's the two sides to the thing. There's the capacity of the land and the care you take of it, but there's also the demand you place on it from the number of people and yes. the lifestyle that they no, bingo. Bingo. I mean, the, the, uh, in writing the last chapter of Dirt, I wrestled with the problem of what's the carrying capacity of the planet in terms of people. And mm -hmm. straight off, you're running right into that problem of, okay, well, how will we live? Because that's, that's as big a variable as how many people there will be. And how much of the planet do we want to leave for other purposes than simply feeding or housing or sheltering humanity? Um, and none of those questions have simple, easy answers. Um, it's, you know, the biggest, that is the challenge of this century is navigating a course that will hopefully lead to a future that we would actually wish upon our descendants. Um, and I firmly believe that that kind of a future is possible. Um, but it will require us facing you know, not only the problem of soil degradation and erosion, but the problem of population, problems of um, um, climate change and CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, how to provide a long-term stable energy source to maintain a technologically sophisticated society, even if it can be set up with agricultural sustainability in, in hand. I mean, there's a lot of challenges this century, but if we don't actually solve the problem of soil degradation this time around, none of those other solutions are gonna matter in the long run. And the so now the outcome for a society that doesn't get this right, and I ga gather this is the vast majority of societies over the millennia, um, is either they emigrate or they collapse, right? They, they have a population collapse in where they are. Yeah, they emigrate or they decline. Because uh, mm -hmm. that's, if, if, you, if you look at the capacity of the land to support people, once that starts to de decline, the people have a choice of either going somewhere else or they're gonna be hard pressed to fit on the same landscape. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in effect, that is ultimately the, the, the two possible outcomes um, or two possible outcomes for societies that that do abuse their soil in the long run. Yeah. Um, the third option, obviously, is to actually restore the soil and reinvest life into it to take care of it. You still then have the, the issues and trade-offs between sort of a lifestyle and number of people. That's, that's an inherent trade-off in any system that has a closed resource base, which as soon as you live on a planet, you're in that kind of system. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's an inherent question that we you know, would be well advised to ask ourselves uh, about you know just how much stuff do we need? What is a good lifestyle? What is enough in terms of uh, um, comfort and luxuries versus necessities? Um, and how many of us should share in them? Um, how can they, should they be distributed? The problem of feeding the world today is really one of not so much our ability to produce the food, but our ability to to share it equitably. Um, there, we grow enough food to feed the whole world at present. Whether we'll be able to do that in 50 years is a whole other question. Um, but the issues of resource uh, distribution equity and scarcity for some uh, are going to be with us either way. Yeah. So how do we navigate our way towards uh, sustainable soil? Boy, you know, a geologist might not be the right person to ask that question. Um, <laughs> no, but you've got a lot of, uh, a lot of. Because <laughs> I can give you the very long-term <laughs> answer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the I think that the the first step is to see the soil differently. I mean, I really think that the first step is to appreciate land and soil as the foundation, the biologic, the living foundation of our civilization. Because at present, we essentially treat uh, our agricultural soils as 
the cheapest agricultural commodity of an input into large scale production. And, you know, what happens to the lowest valued input in a production process? You're not, you're not going to conserve that. You're going to use it up as fast as you can because it's the cheapest input. And so I, I think that philosophically, given that soil is sort of everywhere and that it's not intrinsically valuable in the way that, you know, things you can directly eat or sell are, you know, go try and sell a bucket of dirt, what are you going to get for it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Yet viewed over millennia, it's incredibly valuable. Mm -hmm. It's the inheritance we actually pass on to the future in terms of their ability to feed themselves. That's the fundamental dichotomy. Um, so how do you actually set up a system of agricultural production that's capable of feeding everybody but will sustain the soil? Um, and the first thing, I think, is we have to think about it differently. We have to recognize it as such um, and tailor our farming practices to the land and the capacity of the land to sustain and rebuild fertile soils rather than basically trying to take a uniform technology and apply it across a landscape um, in the same way everywhere all at once, which is effectively what we do now. Um, so that'd be the first step. Then the second step is clearly, you know, how do you set up policies that would encourage uh, long-term behavior that would conserve the soil, preserve, build soil fertility. And there's, there's a lot of room, I think, for debate and argument and creativity in figuring out how to set those up. But what you'd want to do is reward people for increasing the organic matter content in soils, for building soil fertility. It has the advantage of storing carbon in the ground at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, how much you could put in the, back in the ground uh, in terms of carbon over how quick a time is something people argue a lot about. And there's different ways to think about it, ranging from biochar, putting charcoal in the ground, to uh, simply going to no-till agriculture where you don't plow but you leave the crop stubble on from last year and basically let it rot in place and about half of that carbon ends up back in the ground. Um, and do you subsidize people to convert to different practices? Do you incentivize? There's lots of room for arguing about how to do it. But philosophically, the key point is I think we need to encourage people to do that, um, to, to treat land um, as an intergenerational trust, uh, really to be stewards of the land. Um, and think five, six, seven generations out in terms of what we leave in the land, the state that we leave land in. This is traditionally what um, traditional societies have done, too. They've always thought of it in that way. They may not have known how to do it exactly, but that was always their understanding. That you, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the Inca are another good example of a society that actually built very fertile agricultural soils and farmed them for thousands of years in a landscape uh, that's not doesn't have terribly great uh, native soil. Uh, there's Incan terraces that uh, one of the papers I uh, found in researching dirt uh, did uh, soil analyses of the soils in Incan terraces and the native hillsides right next door. And what they basically found was that the the soils that had been farmed for thousands of years and intensively managed by the Inca had more nitrogen, more phosphorus, more potassium. They built agricultural soils even as they used it to feed them to feed themselves. The key was returning organic matter to the land. The Dutch did the same thing with building soils from the, the North Sea when they or, you know, were hemmed in by more powerful neighbors and needed more land, so they, they diked and built out into the ocean. They had a very aggressive program of returning organic matter to the land to build what are now some of the most fertile agricultural soils in Europe. So ending, ending waste is, a, again, kind of as was we've seen in many of these interviews, it, it turns out that, that um, if you take what is now considered waste and systematically put it back into the soil where it belongs, um, you're actually doing a positive thing in three or four ways. Yes, very much so. I mean, we, if you think about uh, what we throw away in cities in terms of food that we don't finish, in terms of uh, organic waste, the, the trimmings from shrubs, the trimmings from trees, all the organic matter in cities that you know, we no longer want because it's, it's either dead or refuse. Uh, what do we do now? We throw it into a landfill, we flush it down the drain, we get rid of it because it's waste. But if you look at that in terms of its potential to help rebuild soils, if it was composted, if it was uh, turned into charcoal and put back into the land, the ability to help return organic matter back to the land, we could take what's now waste and turn it into a resource. Um, and that, that is the essence of efficiency. Um, and if you look out 100 years, again, like a geologist, that's sort of like, you know, that's not all that long from now. Mm -hmm. um, we could totally rethink the way we treat urban waste streams. Uh, whether it's just the, the food and vegetative matter or even human waste. How we treat that and process it and wh where we put it um, 
can change. If you think back 150 years ago, the toilet didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Our whole sort of sanitary infrastructure, we, we could rethink, we could change into the future um, and try and turn what are, are now essentially waste into, um, into closing the loop on the agricultural cycle and returning nutrients back to the land that would keep them in circulation. If we view a soil as, as something that helps matter circulate from the world of life to the world of inanimate stuff, rocks and dead things, it, soils are, are part of the engine that helps the turnover, that keeps that going. But as with any cycle, it, you need the back half as much as you need the front half. And what we've managed to do by taking crops off the land and not returning organic matter to the land is that we're continuing to shave off the top half of the cycle, but we're not feeding the bottom half of the cycle. Um, and that will gradually wind down. And in the context of my book, that would be soil depletion and degradation. Skinning the planet, I think, is the phrase you used at one point. Yes, and yeah, no, because soil is like the skin of the earth. It's, it's, it's thickness, is, it's actually thin relative to the size of the earth compared to our own skin and our own bodies. Um, it, the average soil thickness is on the order of about a meter. The planet's you know, thousands of kilometers uh, across. It's a very thin, fragile layer at the surface of the earth that is really the interface between the dead world of geology and the bustling world of life. Um, and it's that interface that promotes the cycling. It's, it's in many parts, you can view it either as the placenta that allows life to live off the earth because it helps process the matter that we need as nutrients, or you could view it as the engine of life, or you could call it the skin of the earth. All good phrases. Yes. All good phrases. <laughs> now, the, course, the, the, the first question people raise is they say, well, you've got to have industrial agriculture because you've got to produce all this food for all these people and you couldn't possibly do it through an organic system. But you, you, that's not the way you see that. Yeah, because I don't, I don't actually think that's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but no, but I have had... That's, that's uh, a very heartening message. You know, that uh, well, and I, and I actually think that it's, that it's true that it isn't, isn't true. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the catch is, of course, that the, um, what we now call conventional agriculture was not conventional agriculture for the first 10,000 years of agriculture. Organic agriculture was conventional agriculture until very recently. If you look at it in terms of uh, total crop yields, some of the highest yielding farms on the planet are small scale organic farms. Um, there, it's a scale that lends itself very well to sort of labor intensive farming um, and to also a polyculture. If you grow a single crop, you grow a monoculture and you grow one crop in a piece of ground, you're going to have, uh, it's not as efficient in terms of producing uh, net amounts of food as growing several crops in the same piece of ground, either as a polyculture, a polystory polyculture, or with different crops in different seasons. If you look at the, um, the gross productivity of very small scale organic farms, you know, if you could clone that on a large scale, there'd be no problem of feeding the world. So, you could, I think, make the assertion that sort of large-scale industrial monocultures might not be able to feed the world organically. Um, I'm not even sure that's true. Um, but I think that it's, if you really wanted to craft a way to feed the world, if that was your, your real goal, what you'd be promoting is small-scale organic farms because they produce the most food per unit acre, and they do it with the kind of inputs that farmers even in the developing world have, which is dominantly their own labor. Um, you, need, you need land, and you need labor, and you need seeds. Um, of course, the problem with that viewpoint is that small-scale, labor-intensive organic farms are not big money makers for the middleman. There's not a big lobby that's pushing for promoting small-scale organic farms. If we wanted, but if we wanted to really feed the world, we would be promoting land reform in developing countries. We'd be promoting small-scale farmers. We'd be giving them the tools to feed themselves because if there's one thing I'm certain of, it's you're not going to feed the destitute by selling them something. They're destitute. They don't have money. <laughs> That's not, and the chronic hunger problem in the world is not among the affluent. It's among the destitute. So the idea that we could actually you know, develop new crop varieties that are proprietary and that farmers have to buy into a fertilizer intensive and a, and a seed sourced model of farming the idea that you would feed subsistence farmers who had no money that way is insane. I mean, it, it just doesn't add up on the face of it. Um, and it's a long answer to your question about organic agriculture feeding the world. But I think that there's, um, 
if you view it through fairly narrow conventional blinders, there may be something to the question. But I think it's viewing things the wrong way. Um, and I really think that uh, even the model of large scale agrochemical intensive agriculture is not going to pan out in the end, in part because of the problem of you know, crop yields have not kept growing at the rate that they've been projected at. They've plateaued. Um, we have continued to degrade soils and their native fertility. Um, and instead are, are relying on fertilizers and other props, um, um, herbicides and biocides, poisons, to basically maintain food production. And yet, if you look at the soil as an ecological system, and you look at humanity as sort of a, a top predator, if you will, on that ecological system, the ideal strategy for feeding ourselves is to keep that system going at high volume, lots of turnover in life, and skim off as much as we can without interrupting the flow of it. The model of essentially poisoning a soil food web through fertilizers, overuse of fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides doesn't sound like a terribly wise strategy if your view of the soil is that of an ecological system that we're basically skimming off of. Um, instead, you're basically mining soil fertility even in that system, but you're just delaying it longer. And that's where, as a geologist, it concerns me because I think that the a truly sustainable agriculture would be one that is based on cycling of materials through the system. Um, not imports and life within the soil is the engine for driving the turnover of nutrients, for making nutrients available to plants, for getting stuff out of the rocks and out of the old dead stuff and into new new living matter, um, which is really what that whole game's all about. You're almost literally mining at, 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 a, at one remove. I mean, because in a sense what you're doing is filling the soil with fossil fuel products of one type or another. Um, the soil almost is neutral in a sense, and the process is almost like a medium in which the in which the oil is embedded. The crops grow out of the oil, but also the oil is not going to be around forever. Right? Yeah. So if you look if you look out a hundred years, you know, is there anybody who would predict that oil prices will be lower in a hundred years than they are today? You know, you can just look at the the peak oil curves from the oil industry's own data and kind of well, if you buy into any kind of what's called classical economic theory, I guess as the thing gets scarcer, it's going to get more expensive probably going to work that way. Mm -hmm. And yet we rely on, it, on uh, fossil fuels to a disproportionate extent to grow our food today. Sort of a 10 to 1 calorie ratio of how many calories of fossil fuels we burn to grow one of food. Um, if we could eat the oil itself, we'd be better off eating it. By a factor of 10. <laughs> By a factor of 10, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not sure well, it tastes all that good. But then yeah, yeah. the, there's a few um, physiological problems with that. But the point, I think, is a good one and remains that what will we do? in a world when we've played through the supplies of easily available, cheap fossil fuels. Um, and even if you take the issue of, you know, will we burn through the world's coal reserves and, you know, and wreak havoc on the atmosphere over the next few hundred years, we'll still face the same question just a few hundred years later. There's no getting around this question. The question is, when will we address the problem of how do we build a large-scale, sustainable agriculture without relying on fossil fuels? And the answer that I come to inescapably is that the sooner we do it, the better off we'll be and our descendants will be. Because we can't avoid the question. It's simply a matter of time. And as a geologist, that may seem obvious to me, but you know, something, if it's going to come to a head in two decades relative to two centuries, that obviously has a different ring to a politician. Um, but as a species, we're not getting around this question. It would much, make much more sense for us to get ahead of the question, figure out how to actually um, reinvest in native soil fertility and work with nature, work with biological processes to drive our agriculture, rather than working against biological processes um, through herbicides and pesticides. I mean, if you, if you look at what are the species that come back the fastest after the application of broad, broad spectrum biocides, it's the pest species. It's not the ones you want. The pests come back first. We have the same problem with, with microbes and human health and, and um, antibiotics. The species that come back first are not the ones we want around. So if we kill off everything and we're getting back the bad ones first, that's a negative feedback. It's a vicious, it's a vicious circle. The more you use, the more you depend on them. Eventually, you'll run out of the ability to um, actually achieve the results you went to those props for in the first place. And we're seeing that in terms of antibiotic resistance developing. Um, you can't win an evolutionary war against nature. It's, we're just not going to, you know, we're not going to win that. And our agriculture has been fighting the same kind of war. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we'd be far better off, I think, at investing the magnitude of research we've invested into sort of agrochemical technologies. Investing that into understanding soil ecosystems and agriculture as an ecological process and adapt our agriculture to the soil and to the land and to reinvest in rebuilding the life of our soils. To me, that's the, the long-term strategy that makes sense. It's not, unfortunately, it's not the one we're pursuing. And there are some examples, too, of, of cultures which have actually done this quite successfully. And one of them that you mentioned in, in the book is Cuba, which is a really interesting. Uh, not, you, you wouldn't perhaps want to be in the position they were in to get there, but what they did with it, it was brilliant, right? Yeah, the Cuban example is a really interesting one, where they, they got backed into the corner of having their, their client state uh, status with uh, the Soviet Union broken off. Um, they were embargoed, lost access to a lot of petroleum, uh, oil and to agricultural products. And so their agriculture went through a transition that was sort of enforced by a blockade. And they went to greatly organic agriculture. They went to small-scale agriculture or uh, re revised their agricultural techniques, w developed a lot of urban agriculture, and you know, managed not to starve in a, in a system where if you basically buy the argument that uh, we really need fossil fuel intensive agriculture and agrochemical intensive agriculture to survive, well, the Cuban example is kind of a good example that, well, you know, society won't necessarily fall apart if we have to change that. Um, you know, the sideboards of what they went through and their political system and all that kind of stuff is sort of a, a different issue. I'm not sure I'd really want to live through the transition, have lived through the transition there. And, and it's not like they're at an agricultural paradise with an abundant amount of, um, a super abundant amount of food. But they survived. They didn't collapse. I mean, to me, that's the real lesson is that they managed to make a tr major transition in their agricultural practices without extreme societal disruption. Now, they had major societal disruption that sort of came before that, <laughs> but that's a whole different issue. Um, that's not really pertinent to that argument. Yeah. Um, and so if you look at them as a model for how the planet as a whole may be forced to go through a, a post-oil agricultural transition, there's lessons we can learn there. Um, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting example to look at that ha hasn't received the kind of attention that it probably should, both in terms of what to emulate, but also what mistakes did they make? What should we not repeat as we go through that experiment? And that's the value of looking back at past societies or at sort of contemporary societies that have done something innovative for even if coerced. <laughs> um, you know, the, the value is so that we can take the good parts, things that societies did right, leave the bad parts, um, and try and learn the lessons. And we could do some of the things that the Cubans are doing uh, without necessarily transforming our entire agricultural system. But I mean, things like making real use of urban ag agriculture, for oh, example, yes. you know, could enhance our supplies enormously. Oh, hugely. I mean, the ability to grow like fruits and vegetables in particular within urban environments is a huge untapped, relatively untapped potential in terms of helping to feed the world. And especially if you think about how to feed those parts of the, the urban populace that don't really have access to, to really healthy, fresh foods on a daily basis. If you go into sort of a, a grocery store in inner cities in most parts of the United States, you're not going to find the same thing if you walk into you know, the Beverly Hills Whole Foods, if there is one. <laughs> um, um, the, uh, but there's examples of places like Detroit where um, urban agriculture is making a big comeback in terms of growing food within cities. Um, you probably can't grow, probably won't be growing grains and meat in a big way within cities, uh, within cities proper. Um, so we'll always need to sort of a network of urban and farmlands working in concert to essentially feed everybody. But the potential for urban agriculture, I, I think, is huge and relatively untapped. Um, my wife has two planting beds in our yard. That, um, she, we've managed to restore the soil in, in that part of the yard for uh, the last 10 years. The yield we get off these two little planting beds is amazing. Um, we, I won't pretend that we actually feed ourselves out of a couple of vegetable beds in the yard, um, but I've been very surprised by how much food we're actually able to get out of it and how much space there is in urban environments where similar things could be done. Um, and that could really take a big bite out of that. And if you look at the problem of feeding humanity in the future, we're now an urban species officially. More than half of humanity lives in cities. The, to the degree to which we can grow food close to people, it'll help it be accessible, it'll help it be cheap, it'll help it be fresh, it'll help 
it be healthy, and it'll save in the cost of shipping it halfway around the world to get it to places. Yeah, and people seem to have a real desire to do that. There's a lot of enthusiasm about the about urban ag agriculture, community plots, and all that sort of thing. It seems as though that's just a something that's bubbling just under the surface. Yeah, it seems like enthusiasm has been building uh, very much in the last few years for that. Um, and I think it's, I, I don't think that that's a trend that's going to go away anytime soon. Yeah. There's, I mean, one of the beautiful things about growing even just a little bit of food um, in near where you live in a city is that it can connect you with nature. It can connect you with the land. It can remind you that there is a bigger world outside the city than that, that uh, um, and it can, it can bring a little bit of nature actually into an urban environment where that, frankly, it does people good to see a little bit of nature uh, in their immediate lives, even in the middle of a city. Mm -hmm. Just uh, taking a, a walk down a tree-shaded boulevard, even if without urban agriculture, it makes people feel better. I mean, it actually it really, I think, helps with the psychology of living in cities. Mm -hmm. I want to take a, a radical turn now to your other other book uh, and, uh, and your book on salmon. Um, and you were saying that in your you have a course in which you, the students read these two books and say, and, and they have to figure out how they're connected. Yeah, the, the the class is called Dirt and the King of Fish, so it's very creative. Just <laughs> take two book titles, stick them together. Yeah. But um, but it's one mind that created the two of them, so there's obviously a connection. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> Yes, and that's uh, essentially the trick to that class is to get uh, the students to try and uh, look at these problems of sort of long-term agricultural land management of lands and the feedback between the way people treated land, how that affected soil, how soils affected human societies, and the way people treated salmon runs from ancient Scotland to New England to California, the Northwest, and Alaska today, how that's influenced the state of salmon runs, um, and how in both cases the common element is sort of twofold. One, the way that people live on the land, what we do to the land, land use, greatly affects many other things, not all of which are uh, immediately predictable. You look at the decline of salmon runs around uh, in Europe and in North America, and in great part it's a story of changing land use and how that, those changes in land use affected other things that then affected salmon runs. So it's about how the land is connected, um, how um, the way we live on the land will influence things we value, even if those aren't taken into the equation sort of at the, head of, at the start. And it's also a story, both of them are stories, about how small changes consistently biased add up over a long period of time into large changes. In other words, if you lose 1% of your river miles to salmon, uh, that used to be salmon accessible every year. When someone comes and they dam off 1% of the river miles every year. It takes just a century to lose it all. That's about the story of salmon runs in England and New England, you know, different time scales in the different places, but slow change sustained over time, always biased towards decline. Soil degradation and soil erosion is the same story. The, other, the third element of it, that, where they then come back together, is, lies in how those changes are slow enough to never really engender an immediate crisis. And the sort of the punchline of that course is essentially that sometimes things happening the slowest are the hardest to stop. And if you think about it, on the surface that kind of sounds ridiculous. What do you mean? Slow things, hard to stop. But things that really sort of change slowly, run into that problem of the shifting baseline, it's not such a big concern today, maybe they'll deal with that in a generation or two when they've figured out some clever new way to solve the problem. It's just kicking the can down the road, and if it's always biased towards degradation, if you just wait long enough, you burn through it. That's essentially the message of, of both of those books for natural resource management. Um, so the challenge, of course, is how do we get ahead of it? How do we stop that? How do we prevent it? Um, and that is obviously the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> It's a little bit like that old saw that, that uh, what's everybody's business is nobody's business, right? It's not really for our well, yeah, generation. It's, it's, yeah, it's a, a very strong parallel there. Mm -hmm. Very strong parallel there. Yeah. You know, yeah. Don't solve today what will, won't be a crisis for another 20 years. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's it. That's it. Now, do, uh, what about the salmon? Because uh, you know, do you think that that can be turned around? That's, that's been such a, well, like you said, parallel stories of decline was a phrase that, that caught my eye. But, um, same, same sort of story seems to be happening here. And I grew up in BC. I remember being told that the salmon were infinite and nothing that we did could possibly interfere with such a colossal. Uh, there's so many we could never, never. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Same with Douglas fir, actually. But yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and the same stories were told in New England and in Scotland. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
And in New England, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of wild salmon left. Um, the, the ones that have escaped, escaped from fish farms outnumber the wild ones, about 100 to 1, the last paper I saw that quantified it. Um, so there, there is that, that problem. Mm -hmm. it's well, there's a question that arises, and I ask these questions partly because you know, we're, we're doing some work on aquaculture, and, and it, it comes out of particularly out of the expansion of salmon farms on the East Coast. One of the questions that arises is, given that our department, Canada's Department of Fisheries and Oceans, has presided over so many catastrophes, um, and given the way that they have not reacted to the issues here, the question that really is seriously being raised by some people concerned with this is, do they want to fix it? Or is it easier, if this is a bureaucratic society, is it easier for a bureaucrat to manage a fishery that is entirely in net cages and isn't confused by all these people's emotional reactions to this wild, these wild fish that really don't contribute much anymore anyway? Or these conflicts where people want to do things with the land that won't be compatible with sustaining the fish. I mean, yeah. the story of salmon runs in North America is one of people making that choice where they chose to go to hatcheries, chose to go to farms as the way to keep producing fish and not have to um, actually address any of the other land use practices that, were, that degrade salmon habitat and preclude the success of the, of the fishery. Mm -hmm. um, so sadly, there's, there's a long history of, of doing exactly that. Some of it, I think, with um, uh, intent and forethought, but I think the bigger story of it is one where people don't like to be told that they can't do things on the land. And their immediate desire is what they really want. And the, the decisions that kept getting made over and over, whether from the forests of Maine to the damming of the Columbia River to forestry in BC, was the story that, oh, well, we will prioritize the interests of this other industry, um, hydropower, agriculture, forestry and you know it'll have some impact on the fishery but it will, you know we'll try we'll try and mitigate or manage that oh and we'll we'll deal with these technological fixes to try and keep a fishery through hatcheries or through net pens or through other product other means of producing salmon and that decision is sort of um, so there's never sort of a, a, a single decision made that oh it'd be easier to just manage the fishery if it was all hatcheries but that's how the whole system is set up to drive towards as a logical outcome if you wait long enough. Um, by simply prioritizing every other conceivable use in the landscape over fish production in those areas that are crucial for fish production, <laughs> you've essentially created a systemic bias that will lead you towards that outcome um, without ever there being a, a conscious policy decision made towards that effect. That, I think, is actually more likely the real dynamic uh, behind it. Because I, I was not able to uncover a single example in my historical research for King of Fish of people arguing, well, we should just like, let this run go extinct. Mm -hmm. you know, there, I, for some places where you know, building a single dam high enough, that was the default thing that was made. But the decision was never made with the intent of doing that. The yes. decision was yeah. always made for, for other intentions, and that was just, you know, sort of a side effect that was perhaps undesirable if it was even noticed or acknowledged. But you and make enough decisions in that same framework, and they add up. And maybe that is the, I guess that is the connective tissue to a large extent between your, your interests here, isn't it? Is, 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 is drawing attention to what are really almost geological processes, social processes, right? Yes, Social right. processes that are kind of parallel to geology and that they're incremental, very small, very slow. But over one, one geologist said to me at one point, geological processes are very slow, but they're very persistent, and they have all the time <laughs> in the world. They and literally have all the time <laughs> in the world, <laughs> <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> And these are I'll remember that one. That's <laughs> a good line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> these are, these are social, social equivalents to that, right? They're very slow, but they're very persistent, yes. and they have lots of time. Very, mm -hmm. I think that's I think a terribly good analogy. Mm -hmm. um, and that, re that really is the case, and that is behind a lot of my interest in these things. Um, and if you layer on to that the aspect of the way the land surface and its dynamics influence and shape some of those dynamics, um, that's a pretty good characterization of why I'm interested in these things. Because um, as a geologist, seeing how humanity changes the face of the earth is, you know, it's interesting to me. Seeing how that adds up over time to big change is interesting to me. 
And the message that one consistently gets, at least from these two examples of soil and salmon, uh, are that we really should, we need to pay attention to how those things play out in the long run because it's going to impact things we either really care about, like salmon runs, or really depend on, like fertile soil. Um, and yet we're not acknowledging that in our decision making. We're not accounting for it. We're just sort of bullying ahead and remodeling the world yeah. without worrying about what we're actually building. I read a piece about, um, th there's another element, which is that we're not really paying attention to our own children, our own responsibilities to our own our own species, right? In the end. Mm -hmm. I read somebody commenting about uh, Easter Island, about the way that those great statues had uh, had been torn down and demolished at great sacrifice in what was obviously just an outburst of sheer rage um, by people at their ancestors and at the way that their ancestors had stupidly pillaged the island. You know? And I kind of think, wonder if we're setting our, ourselves up for that kind of rage in our own descendants because of our failure to pay attention to these things that we can know about, can, can act on, but don't. I think it's a very legitimate worry. I think mm -hmm. it's a very legitimate worry. Um, I would like to think that we're not so far along in the process this time that mm -hmm. we can change the outcome and that we could actually uh, preclude that scenario from playing out. But it's a very real possibility of that, of that scenario playing out later, later this century. A um, lot of things are going to come to a head in the light, latter half of the 21st century. I'm not going to be around to see it, um, but people will be. I mean, those people aren't alive yet today, <laughs> for, for the most part. And, they won't and we're making fun. decisions that are going to fundamentally shape the world that they inherit. Yeah. And you know, it, it, it ought to be a fundamental tenet of a civilized society to intend to leave your descendants the world in a better shape than you got it. Or at least not worse. At least not worse. I mean, I would like to aspire to leaving it in a better shape. Um, and I'd like everybody to aspire to that. But, you know, at least not worse. Um, that kind of ethic is nowhere, I mean, it, that doesn't even play into civic discourse today in terms of long-term planning. And yet, I think if you asked most people individually about their view of the long run and their view of intergenerational I call it intergenerational equity, intergenerational responsibility, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, your duty to your great grandchildren. <laughs> um, I think if you talk to most people individually, they'd have a fairly similar perception that, well, we really should leave things better off to future generations. We shouldn't just, like, you know, burn up all the resources on the planet and party today because we can do that. <laughs> um, and, and the fundamental dichotomy is if, if and I may be misguided about my sort of faith in, in most people at having what I would consider to be the right attitude, but I don't think that's misplaced. I think most people I've ever talked to, that's kind of their attitude. Um, they may have different ways of expressing it and different ideas of how to get there and so forth and so on and, and different politics, but the same underlying feeling about wanting things to get better for the future. And yet the way we're setting the world up, the way we're running the world, isn't doing that. It's not set up to do that. It's, it's, it's demonstrably leading us towards the opposite. Um, there's a real dichotomy there between our individual aspirations and our um, collective leadership. Absolutely. Absolutely. One, I guess one last thing that sort of, of uh, uh, captures that. This was a sentence of yours that, that, that really struck me and, and, uh, and it kind of brings to a focus um, a whole bunch of things. What does it say for the long-term prospects of the world's many endangered species if one of the most prosperous regions in the richest country on Earth cannot accommodate its icon species? Oh, yeah. I read that and I thought, you know, this is so much bigger than salmon. And your, your, most, you know, your most recent comments, it's really bigger than, it's, it's really ultimately, this is, these are moral and spiritual issues, aren't they? They are. No, they really are. Yeah. I mean, that's in terms of how to think about them and how to motivate action on them and how to design possible ways to preclude the outcome nobody wants, <laughs> they really do boil down, I think, to issues of ethics and morality mm -hmm. uh, and, and spirituality. Um, however you want to sort of cast those three, they're in the mix because it shapes how you feel about um, you know, your own obligations, our societal obligations to each other and to the future. And I think salmon really are a good example of mm -hmm. that because there's a lot of concern in the Pacific Northwest, um, writ broadly, about how to conserve this, this wild icon species. <laughs> um, and there's a lot of money that's been spent to try and do it. 
but there really still are some fundamental aspects of the problem that aren't being addressed in terms of driving causal elements. The way we urbanize, the way we develop, the way we build. Um, they're consistently taking, you know, rethinking um, the style of development that we uh, um, build out upon the land um, is really kind of off the table and yet would be essential toward, to designing a land use or land use portfolio for a region where you could confidently predict that we could bring back a major sustainable fishery and accommodate a doubled human population. Um, and frankly, you can't do that without thinking ahead and planning. And planning has almost become sort of a dirty word in terms of sort of thinking about things because it's viewed as governmental control and so forth. But the flip side is, is that if we don't rationally think about what's going to be happening in the future and try and plan for possible outcomes that we prefer over others, we're going to be left with that shifting baseline problem. We're going to be left with the problem that small incremental decisions biased consistently in one direction will lead to an outcome that nobody desires. David Montgomery, professor of geology at the University of Washington and author of two important books, Dirt, The Erosion of Civilizations, and King of Fish, The Thousand Year Run of Salmon. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. Thanks for watching. <laughs>